13 U.S. Chess Championships here at the St. Louis Chess Club. We're in round four, and yesterday we saw two clear winners emerge in both of their respective sections. Gata Kamsky leading the championship by half a point with a perfect 3-0 score, and Irina Krush leading the U.S. Women's Championship. Let's take a look at the standings for the U.S. Chess Championship. Now, round four coverage, I'm Jennifer Shahadi. I'm with Grandmasters Yasser Sarawan and Maurice Ashley. Just as every day, we're going to be bringing you up-to-the-minute analysis of these games. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this round four. Gata Kamsky, as you mentioned, perfect score. Only one in the competition with a shout of uh, winning the Bobby Fischer Prize of $64,000 for a perfect result. And then we also have Conrad Halt with two and a half points, and he's going to be facing Gata Kamsky today. In the women's championship, we've got Irina Krush, half a point ahead of the field with a perfect 3-0 score. Fine Kings Indian defense victory yesterday against Anna Zatansky, her main rival. Now, her main rival in this tournament may very well be Tate Vabrahamian, who always really brings her best chess to the U.S. Women's Championship and is sitting on two and a half out of three. Just a very, very short distance of a half a point behind, so it's a big... Uh, match in those games today on round four. And then we have a webcam. Yes, we've got a, our big game of the day in the championship, Gata Konsky and Conrad Halt in the U.S. championship, and we're going to pay careful attention to that one. And uh, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley has more for us on key matchups of the day. Well, this championship has seen a very strong collegiate presence. Already five, at least five players on the men's side alone who just came off taking finals and we know the stress of that and having to jump into the waters with the sharks at this tournament well they have acquitted themselves quite well on the top board we see 21 year old conrad holt out of the university of texas at dallas and he's on two and a half points chasing gadakomsky uh, in the in this round also the real surprise though is FM, FIDE Master John Bryant, the only player in the field without an international master or international grandmaster title. And he has surprised everyone uh, with two and a half points out of three playing today against the Bear, Big Larry, Big Larry Christensen. He's also at the University of Texas at Dallas, so that school must know something. And they will be acquitting themselves today, trying to see if they can keep on with this hot start. Jen and Yaz? Thank you, Maurice. Jennifer, let's just jump right into game one. All right, what do you think? Shall we take it from the top? We have Conrad Holt. Now, this is interesting. Yeah, Conrad playing d4. Right. And remember earlier in the tournament, Gadakansky chose to play the Dutch defense. Right. Uh, he um, got us back to his favorite Slav. The, that is to provide by this move c7, c6. And, well, let me get my red. There we go. And Black is preparing to capture this pawn and defend that pawn with a move b5. And Conrad follows the main lines. And now a7, a6, e3, all very standard up to this move. This move, e7, e6, surprised me a lot. And frankly, I don't think it's a good move. <laughs> uh, let's put it that way. Uh, too many, too many pawn too weird of a mixture because you've got the fan kettle, which isn't that typical in the slab already. And then you also have the a6 move, which is very specific. you right. To try to play b5 in some positions. And then adding, in addition to that, e6, you just think it's, it's too many systems mixed up together? Yeah, it looks like a jumble to begin with. Obviously, b7, b5, it would have been the most standard move. Even bishop c8 to f5 deserves attention. I just don't like this move e7, e6, which basically uh, locks in this bishop on, um, on, c8. C on c8. And the g g7 one is not actually all that much better because it's biting on granite on d4 for the moment. Um, its pr future prospects are surely a lot better than the one on c8, but still remains to be seen. Uh, you know, from a classical point of view, if we had one of our students lock their bishop in like that, we would say, what are you doing? That's a big pawn. That is a big uh, pawn. Of course, Gata Kamsky Grandmaster Preparation has some specific reason he's doing this, but we, we noticed that in this tournament, it's not about big openings for him. Mm -hmm. Even yesterday against Larry Christensen, he got pretty much nothing out of the opening. That's right. He just and outplayed, them, outplayed Larry later in the game. And against Trofe, I believe, as well. You know, he played... 
he played the Leningrad against the Leningrad Dutch against Trove. So it's interesting to me that he's playing against two different young guns and kind of choosing diametrically opposed openings. Against Trove, he played a very dynamic opening, and against mm -hmm. Holt, he's playing a much more solid, close to the vest opening. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because Holt is a stronger player, even though they're both young? Holt is, you know, four years older than Caden, and he's already a grandmaster, whereas Caden is still aspiring to that title. And I am at 14, certainly on his way, but a little bit less experienced. Yeah, I, I, I just think that God is feeling the tournament and mixing his openings and defenses quite okay. Again, I just don't uh, fully fathom or understand this move E7, E6. Uh, as a classical player, I myself would just play E3, E4, opening up the avenue of this bishop on C1. If we were to see, for example, a trade, I just like these positions for white. I just think they're far more favorable uh, <coughs> when this bishop is stuck back there on c8. I just like white's position very, very much. Oh, sure. I mean, if you had, for, if you were an e4 player or a d4 player, I imagine that if you knew that you could get this position every game where, you know, you have all your pieces developed into the perfect squares and your opponent seems like they have a couple weird moves, a6 and e6, right. we would sign up for that opening, right? Of course, certainly, without question. So it's a little, it's a little bit puzzling, but I think what it is is also Gatikansky, of course, is very serious about this tournament. I bet you he's studying everybody's games in depth before he plays them, and maybe he noticed some discomfort with Halt in a certain type of position and tried to exploit it. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Conrad played the move b2, b3, which ha certainly is understandable. The bishop uh, could come out here to the a3, be, in, be on a good diagonal. Rook e8, bishop b2. Hmm, mystifying. I don't understand why the bishop is better on b2 rather than a3. And after knight bd7, queen c2. Okay, normal, defen uh, normal development by white as, again, white, I think, should be angling for the central pawn break e3, e4. b7, b6, finally trying to bring this bishop into the game with bishop uh, c8 to b7, followed by c5. And white to play. Let me just make sure that I'm up to date with the latest moves, and we are. So in a position like this, it makes it's very normal for white to simply bring his rooks into the center, and we will determine hereafter uh, who stands better and why. Um, okay, a little slight edge for white. Shall we go take a look at some of the other games? Yeah, let's move on. Let's take a look at uh, Larry Christensen versus John Bryant. That's going to be a big game. Oh, without question. First of all, uh, John Bryant sitting at two and a half ha out of three, only one half point behind uh, the leader, Gata Kamsky. Uh, Larry is white. Interesting. Larry can throw out e4 as well as d4. He chose d4 mm -hmm. today. We have a queen's gambit. And then this move knight takes d5. Um, this, this is a quasi Grunfeld. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a Grunfeld <coughs> without the bishop being peddled. Recently, it's a defense that uh, Vladimir Kramnik has been championing on the black side as black does get an opportunity to trade off two pairs of pieces, which makes it, oops, which makes it a little bit easier for the second player. On the other hand, white has occupied the center and got the classical e4, e4 pawns. And once again, we have some issues with our bishop on c8. Yes, indeed. Knight c6. And I think we're up to date. Let me just double check. This is still all very standard play. The, the most common uh, way for white to play in this variation is bishop c4. Then we would see a move like castles, castles, b6. Rook d1, bishop d7, rook e1, still deeply in theory. Um, Larry will be very familiar with this uh, setups for both sides because he plays both sides in this position. 
Absolutely. And then we have another game that I'm really excited about on board three. Oh, no. Shabala versus Onishu. Two players in this tournament who could easily make a run. I mean, Shabalov, just an absolutely aggressive player who is excelling in switches where you have to string a lot of wings together. Right. It's very dynamic. And then Onishuk, of course, a fantastic player who right. definitely could challenge Kamsky. And I think when both of these guys play Kamsky, it's going to be really interesting games. Well, uh, first of all, I'm delighted that Shab Shaba has come back. He had that w uh, round one loss to Gada, right? Right. And oh it yes, was of really course. that's true. And it was really like Shaba felt like he had a big advantage coming out of that opening, and, and he, as he mentioned, oh and yeah, <coughs> that was a um, French defense. The French defense with right. with knight on c5 and c4, and then Gada ended up uh, giving up the two bishops, and he had the two knights against Why the two bishops. Why was that polite? But Shaba was happy with his opening. He huh? was more yeah. than happy. He really yeah. felt that he let that game slip. But Shaba came back with two wins in a in a row, won uh, a lucky victory over Jorge, Sim uh, Jorge, and today he is white against the number three seed, Onishuk, a uh, stalwart of U.S. Team, uh, Olympic teams, and Onishuk, uh, pardon me, uh, Alex with <laughs> Shabalov, I should say, with white, plays the Catalan, and Alex says, okay, I'll capture the pawn, and knight c6. This is one of the uh, most challenging systems uh, in the Catalan when white captures this pawn on c4 and most especially with this move rook b8. He says, hey listen, I want to play b7, b5 and hold on to my ill-gotten gains here uh, with the pawn on c4. Uh, I Actually, I've been playing some blitz chess of late and I was playing the black side of this variation. This move a4 uh, followed by a5 is a very common uh, strategy. And I was doing something very weird here. I was sacrificing uh, this exchange to just keep uh, this pawn and some light squares. Let me see exactly how I was doing it. I think I was doing, hmm. Well, you tried to take, did you try to take back with the, uh, the queen on b8 or? Yeah, you know, I was trying to win this light square bishop, and I, I'm, I'm wondering why I'm not leaving the a6 pawn on pre. Just an, an idea of what I was trying to do uh -huh. was to get some position like this, where I've given up the exchange in return for, cat, uh, for white's Catalan bishop, but I think I've mixed the moves. So apologies for that. But well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll take a look at that. Uh a, uh, knight c3, let me just make sure that we're up to date with the moves. Indeed, knight c3 was played. So very challenging uh, decision by Shabalov with this move knight c3. Now I wonder what his intention is in case black just plays b5 and says I want to keep the pawn on c4. Should white play a line like this? I'm not sure. Bishop c6, I can meet with a6, a4. Very sharp play. For the moment, white remains a pawn down. Uh, it's a question of what if white can play queen b4 and later win that pawn or not. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Monster probably, you would probably be compelled to play bishop e7 there, you know, mm -hmm. in that final position. Well, we are going to take a quick break and be back with a bunch more games in the round four of the U.S. Chess Championship. All righty. Hello and welcome back to 2013 U.S. Chess Champion action. We've got Gata Kamsky and Conrad Holt, our key game of the day here. Yasser, what do you think? Well, from the opening, I thought that Conrad played it a little too slow. He delayed advancing this pawn, e3, e4, and by the time he did, this uh, Gada had already developed his bishop on b7. And I think because of that delay, Gada has now equalized the position. This move, f7, f5, was a very key move. This bishop on e4 is making it, in it impossible for black to get in the freeing move, freeing advance, c6, c5. F5 drove the bishop away, and now this key move, C5, opening up the bishop, uh, 
That was the key problem, right? We were saying earlier that that bishop on c8 was going to have trouble Precisely. getting into the game. And uh, here they go, both bishops leaping into action. And the only real issue for black being that backward e-pawn. Exactly. And that's going to get solved probably uh, immediately. I think white must feel compelled to play the move bishop e2, protecting the knight and also opening up the way for the rook. And after, for example, a move like queen e7, takes on c5, knight takes c5, black secures this nice little outpost on e4 and Ooh. is ready to play e6, e5. So I think Gata is doing quite well. I would agree. I point. really like the kingside majority in these types of positions. If it's an end game, maybe we go for the queenside majority, but in this middle game, it's, it's just very fun to start pushing those pawns, and I think Gata is going to have fun in this position. Now, speaking of fun, we like our strategic battles, but boy, do we have a slugfest in the women's championship, and Grandmaster Ashley has more on that. Yes, Jen, we love fighting games, and there's no more opening that's a titanic struggle than the dragon. It's uh, been known for years. Bobby Fischer used to, to say, you know, throw the H-pawn forward, sack, sack, and mate. But the dragon aficionados have been defending their fiery opening for decades. And today we see in this matchup between Tatev Abrahamian, who, who, by the way, is in second place, only a half a point behind Irina Crush, who's good friend she's playing. And Irina Zenyuk said, there's no better friend in the world than my friend Irina Crush, and she's now trying to hold back the main rival that is Tatev. And they're playing this incredible dragon. What makes the dragon so much fun? Well, it's because this king sits on this side of the board in the Yugoslav. The king castles on this side, and white goes to castle on the other side. So you see the game uh, proceeded with the march of the H-pawn here, and then this move, the Soltis variation, blocking the pawn, and now queen to d2, and then rook to c8, jumping to the open file. And they're in mainline territory, castles, and now knight to e5. Now you see both kings on opposite sides, and bishop to g5, the main line, rook to c5. You rarely see this stuff these days, king to b1, and now b5, throwing the pawn forward, and white, not to be denied, throwing her pawn forward. And here they go, the pawn storm happening, G takes h5, ripping the position open. a4, attacking the bishop, ignoring that with h6. Pawn going forward. This line is absolutely crazy. Bishop back to h8, and now h7 check. More attacks. Now knight takes, and after bishop to d5, this somewhat paradoxical move to me, bishop to g7, but they're playing quickly. They're playing a pace. They're in the main territory in the dragon. Crazy line attacks. Somebody's going to die today. That's what we love about this opening. It's such a fight, totally unbalanced, terrific struggle. We'll see how it goes. Back to you, Jen and Yaz. And these two have a history of duking it out. In fact, Tatev and Zenyuk also played a dragon in 2009, and that was a Chinese dragon. That with the, with the rook b8 variation. Exactly, yeah. rook b8 type move early on, um, very trendy at the time, but now we have a more traditional dragon. Do you, you want to? Do you want to pull it up? Dragon. Sure. Dragon's one of my favorite openings. Well, it's a massive theoretical battle, as uh, Maurice was making clear, and it also very clear to me that the ladies are exceptionally well prepared. I can only imagine how much, how many hours of work must have gone into this particular <laughs> battle before they got to the board, and what Maurice was saying is. Both sides are attacking uh, the respective kings on opposite sides of the board. Uh, white played h6, h7, bishop d5, bishop g7. Again, uh, in such a tense encounter, this move bishop g7 is a really kind of a slow move. But OK, the bishop is obviously better on g7. Is it worth an entire tempo? I'm not so sure. F4, blowing this knight out of its happy outpost on E5. And I guess that's the latest in this theoretical battle. I would reckon knight C4. How about yeah, you, I think Jen? knight C4 will happen. And then it's a question, um, do, we, do we queen? Yeah, do we play queen G2 here? 
queen. Then that would G6. run into knight e3. I just right. I'm trying to like hit on that g6 pawn or queen. I so we might have to go all the way to h2. Okay. Or we could take the knight. I mean, taking the knight is usually the first thing to consider. Like this, bishop yeah. takes, maybe rook takes, attacking this knight on d4. But this looks like white's getting, like black's getting tons of counterplay very quickly. I'm, geez, I'm, I'm, yes, yes, it, it, it's weird. I'm just, it's such a sharp because position. With the bishop off of the diagonal also, if black, black, black can just consider playing the weird looking f6, which uh, does trap the bishop on g5. Okay, that's another one uh, to be concerned about, right, with a knight here yeah. being attacked. Let's go back one so move. So maybe just not taking on c4, maybe just queen h2 with the, uh, the idea that maybe we're going to get there first. Now normally letting that knight live on c4 is, is very dangerous in dragon, mm -hmm. and you kind of instinctively take it off, but boy, white's attack might just be coming faster. Yeah, I uh, always look for... Queen a5 maybe first? Uh, you want to yeah. play knight b2 immediately. Well, I'm not sure. Um, I always... You, you have to look at these kinds of moves like knight a3 check when that knight on c3 is only guarded by... Mi merely guarded by this pawn on b2. So imagine a knight a3 check with the idea of playing b5, b4. This could get scary for white as well. I mean, anybody, it's wild, anybody's game. Oh yeah, here. although, yeah, I mean, that, that's one candidate move. That's, and, and, then, and then also the, uh, the queen a5 and knight b2 ideas, and you're right, even taking on b2 immediately is worth calculating, because after king b2, you can even look at a3 or, or rook takes c3 with the idea of queen a5 check. And right. I mean, all these things need to be checked. Well, I tell you, the, the only way I would want to enter this variation with either color is to uh, be well, well prepared, put it in an engine and having given it a great deal of, uh, of preparation. This is an ex extremely sharp line where every move is telling. I think, I think Tatsev is probably better prepared in this tournament, so I would have to give the edge to her in this, uh, in this game. Mm -hmm. um, I think she excels in these types of attacking positions, and I have a feeling that uh, she has some great preparation here. I know that she takes this tournament extremely serious, so let's see if Queen H2. My issue is what if like, she just ignores anything that black does and plays H5? I mean, like, how fast are we getting there? You know, it's like not that far from checkmate, like, right? If you play, if we play queen h2 and you play, e even if you play knight b2, what if we even ignore that and just play h5? I mean, how fast does this, does this train come? <laughs> uh, good question. I mean, you can well, play knight d1 and then we take on g6. I mean, knight takes c3, king a1. Like, aren't we close to mating you? Well, as Maurice has mentioned, uh, the dragon is one of those variations that has more lives than a cat. Yeah. And I'll just point out one defensive idea for black. I know it's painful, but check this out. We have rook ah, h3. Rook h3. Nice. Nice <laughs> Isn't time. that just terrible to block the h file just when you're absolutely sure you're ready to deliver checkmate? Although, I mean, we, d we, d we can grab we can grab on h7, but then your idea is just play king h8 and squirrel away there. Right. Now the pawn actually is a protection for the black king. So we can't just be so cavalier and sacrifice everything. We need to find the perfect defensive move and then go for the onslaught. But it does feel like white's attack is coming faster than black. But you know, it always feels that way in the dragon. And that's why Bobby Fischer famously said that it's a very dangerous opening to play against lower rated players. Right. Like if you're playing against a player 400 points or lower rated than you, Dragon is like one of the biggest losers. Like yeah. You just don't want it because it's such a tactical melee and it can be decided so quickly and the moves can tend to be clearer for white, a mm -hmm. little bit more obvious, mm -hmm. I think, that if you, um, if you play it against somebody much weaker, you might just find yourself getting upset. I remember in the 80s and 90s that Tony Miles, uh, very famous grandmaster from the UK was doing horrible things to the white players. He was a little bit ahead of his time in terms of his preparation. He was playing the black side of the dragon, and it, these this defense, you know, it's all about preparation. And in this particular case, I do think that Queen H2 does lead to this kind of crash and burn type of attack, where maybe Knight takes B2. As, uh, a and key then if move. we play, if, okay, so instead of going h5, which I agree might be a little bit too fast, um, what if we just take the knight? Okay. 
And let's go with just the direct Jess stuff. Jess worked what take C3 with the idea of a, a queen what, what A5 you, check. Yeah, you had mentioned this yeah, a moment ago. Because I, I noticed that if I play king B2, you have a queen B4 check, and now you're you're hitting my um, my knight on B4 a number of times. I, 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 but then I noticed that maybe what about the D, what about King D three? That's King, why King David three. Yeah, that's why I like wasn't one hundred percent sure the King B three. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're only down a rook here for Black. <laughs> you can only say that in the Dragon, right? <laughs> right, we're only right, down right. A rook, only right. a Rook. Only a Rook. It biggie. must be good. <laughs> um, I be, may, like Rook, rook C eight. Yes, that's very normal. Trying to take advantage of the C three square, perhaps. Yeah, it's tricky because, you know, our threat is something like rook c3 check, king e2, bishop takes d4, and then we play rook takes c2 and win your queen on h2. Okay. And it's actually not that easy to stop, it seems, right. because anything you move destroys another defense, doesn't it? Like, if you play knight e2, then it opens up our bishop on c3, and I can play the rook c3 check? Anyway. Uh, maybe not. No, I guess I can't. You're gonna run, huh? Um, that's a bit too much. But after knight e2, I probably have something better. Um, what do we have instead? Mm -hmm. Something good, no doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. Just b, just some, just a quiet move like b b4 to get our bishop into the attack, or. Well, who? But then you can run there? with king e3. Okay, I kind of I was waiting for you to prompt me with that bishop b5 check. How about if I continue with the idea of checkmate on the king side? Now right. you uh, you have opened up bishop b5 check, but as you mentioned just a moment ago, I'm ready to run and run. Um, I think that Maurice was pointing out a better move, uh, something with maybe after. In this position, do do play rook c3. So rook c3, and then after after knight c3. To capture with a queen, one would say. And then yeah, we missed something here. I. Bishop and now bishop g4. Ah, okay. That yeah, that's what we missed. We stopped looking at it at this position, but actually bishop g4, very yeah. strong, bringing one more piece into the attack. Exactly. Yes, and, and then when we we actually when we take on b1, it's also going to leave that queen on h2 unprotected. So you're not even going to be able to, to recapture it. Well, actually, I'm afraid it's that just if I go just king mating, here. king f2, queen f3 check, right? Yeah. So that's just going to be disastrous. So that just simply doesn't work. So here, hmm, maybe it's time to to hitch our ride right away, or should I? Oh boy, I'm not sure. Maybe I should block this whole c file action. Maybe queen b2 is a little bit more defensive minded to protect the, the square c3. And so we're down a rook. So <coughs> if, we, if we capture on d2 tw two and take on d4, we're still going to be down an exchange, right? Oh, I'm sorry. You just take with the rook. Excuse me. So. We have to. Mm. Have to keep pieces on the board. Yeah. Definitely. Can't Don't trade here. So yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Something the the like move b4 seems correct. Threatening rook c3. Mm -hmm. And also, a moment ago, there was that variation where the bishop was coming to g4. Still, if I get on my bicycle and try to run away. If you get on your bicycle and try to run away, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we probably play rook c3 check. Okay. And by the way, you had pointed out that white's bishops aren't like on ideal squares, at a certain moment, you might want to try to simply win one of them. But okay, rook c3 check, I understand. Uh, you've got to look at the checks first. Always check it, maybe mate. I see what you're saying, like at some point we can basically just bail out and play e6 and try mm -hmm. to win one of your offending bishops, right? Right. Because th it's just going to be very hard for the bishop to play anywhere, right? Exactly. Like if it goes to b7, the only free square, um, we can even play a queen b6 or queen a7 type move and exactly taking advantage of the pin on b4. So extremely complicated, but looking like a very downward trend for white. 
Yeah, well, again. So, I, so maybe uh, we were wrong. I mean, my, my first instinct was Tata's preparation here was better, so like I favored her. Mm -hmm. But after night to C4, um, maybe we have to go back to this uh, mm -hmm. bishop takes C4 idea rather than the queen H2, which uh, falls into that knight takes B2. Right. So bishop well, C4 I didn't like because it just seems so direct after rook takes C4 that you're threatening knight takes B4 and you might be threatening F6. Exactly. So that just seemed like too much, but... I was thinking that White should just keep her queen or hovering around the C3 square, maybe something like queen to D3, and I'm seeing that this is falling for a very different kind of a tactic that you don't often see in a dragon where the knight comes to B2, forking queen and rook. A rather unusual, very unusual fork. Boy, I'm say. loving these variations. We are having a lot of fun here at the US Chess Championship, and we're going to just take a quick break to try to make the uh, viewing experience even smoother for our lovely viewers at home. Excellent.